Tanganyika province under Kanyama. So your servant for this time is Dr. Emmanuel Mwamba. I'm actually the uh, HIV TB medical mentor under Lusaka Provincial Health Office. So Tim, uh, this is a short session. So let's ensure that uh, we follow the ECHO etiquette by ensuring that we mute ourselves when we are not on the floor and we maximize on the chat um, on the chat box. So once more, thank you very much for joining us. We are going to start with the Petauke case. And uh, we'll actually, and later on, we'll, um, we'll get the Kanyama case after the Petauke case. Dr. Wezi, I hope you are also on the call. Dr. Wezi? Dr. Wezi, are you able to get us? Oh, yes. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, so good afternoon, Network. My name is Dr. Wezi Mugambu. I'm the district um, medical mentor for Petalke District. And I'll be presenting the case on behalf of uh, Eastern Province. I hope my screen is visible. Yes, Doc, you are visible. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so we're presenting a case of a female 34 who presented with a two month history of a headache, progressive uh, loss of balance and cognitive function. She also gave history of night sweats, weight loss, uh, sorry, night sweats is repeated and a fever. The history of presenting compl uh, complaints, she developed the above symptoms two months prior to presentation. So she came to us uh, the first week of January and her symptoms started um, at the end of uh, September. Her partner noted a change in her behavior and loss in the ability to balance associated with vom vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal and abdominal pain for six weeks. The review of systems, the respiratory, she had she had history of a cough that was productive associated with chest pain. The cardiovascular, she complained of orthopnea as well as shortness of breath. In the GU, there was uh, nothing of significance. In her past medical history, she was not diabetic, hypertensive, or epileptic. She had no history of TB, neither did she have any history of a non-TB contact uh, staying with her or near her. She was uh, newly diagnosed HIV positive on the day of presentation. In terms of drug history, she had been on flagell as well as uh, ORS and traditional herbs. The past surgical history, there was nothing of significance. Her LMP was uh, in December of 2022 and she was a para seven. In terms of her social history, she was married. Uh, there was no history of alcohol or smoking. Her spouse was also newly diagnosed HIV positive and they came from a polygamous, polygamous marriage. Uh, the other wives at that time had not yet been reached for testing. And the physical examination at her last visit, the BP was uh, 99 over 86 millimeters of mercury. Her temperature was 37.8 with respiratory rate of 26 uh, breaths per minute. She was slightly tachycardic with 110 beats per minute. Her muoc was at 20 centimeters. Her weight was 40 kgs and her RBS was 4.5. We were unable to calculate her BMI as she was unable to, to stand. But according to muoc, she was in uh, moderate. In CNS, she had a stiff neck, 
Kerning's test was positive. She was unable to stand, so gait was not assessed. She was incoherent and not oriented to time or place. She was mildly pale with no jaundice or cyanosis. There was no clubbing and no edema. Her Glasgow coma scale was at 11 over 15. She also had left-sided facial ptosis. Uh, under respiratory system, she was tachypneic and there were coarse basal crepes bilaterally. There was some suprapubic tenderness. Vaginal exam, there was no cervical motion tenderness and her skin integu and her integument was normal. So in terms of her laboratory tests, we did manage to get an HP done and the result was 8.9 grams per deciliter. We collected for creatinine, but um, unfortunately it was not able to, to be run at the time. We recollected at a later stage and it was 103 millimoles per mil. CD4, unfortunately, we were unable to do as uh, it was out of stock in the whole district. For urine lamb, this was done and was positive. Serum crag was also positive. CSF crag was negative. Uh, the description of the CSF was clear. There was high pressure, high opening pressure um, at the time of the lumbar puncture. The sample was sent for India Inc. and uh, no cells, no yeast cells were seen. In terms of chemistry, there was a comment to say there was lymphocytosis noted and RST was uh, non-reactive and glucose was 2.6. For gene expert, unfortunately it, able, it was unable to run. Gram stain uh, was not done and a culture was not done because there were no cells that were uh, seen. For imaging, there was a chest x-ray that was done. Unfortunately, I don't have the the actual film to show you, I think it um, went missing somewhere in the ward. I do apologize for that. However, there was marked perihilar lymphadenopathy and the miliary picture. On ultrasound, there was a noted to be fluid in the pouch of Douglas, but other, or other uh, organs were normal. Okay, so in terms of, um, the other results, a baseline viral load was collected uh, on the day that she was tested. In terms of ART, she was not um, on art. And then in our top right-hand corner, these are just the results that I've, um, I've talked about, except uh, an addition here is that we had hepatitis B that was done, the surface antigen, and it was negative. So the questions that we have as a district and facility from the team that was handling the case uh, a comment here, the client was admitted on the date of HIV diagnosis and resuscitated accordingly. The same day ART initiation was not implemented. She was initiated on four FDCs and cryptococcal meningitis management with amphotericin B. So uh, the plan was as follows, four FTCs, a potericin B at one gram per kg, fluconazole, 1,200 milligrams per day, keftriaxone, one gram OD, and septrin. Uh, just to note that there was an initial stock out of amphotericin B, so we only managed to start her on cryptococcal meningitis about three days later. So our questions are as follows. In the absence of a positive CSF crag, can we make a diagnosis of cryptococcal meningitis? The second is what approach should be used for treatment of TB and cryptococcal meningitis co-infection with regard to the use of steroids? And what recommendations can be made to the pedophilia team in the management of this patient? Uh, thank you, Ms. Dr. Mwamba. Uh, this concludes the the case summary. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Wesley, for this um, uh, good uh, case pre presentation. So maybe just um, a, a summary of um, 
uh, the case, we are actually dealing with um, a female, um, female 24 uh, client who has come with headache and uh, headache, weight loss, as well as uh, night sweats and um, productive cough. And this is a polygamous marriage where we are having a, 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 the, the husband also newly diagnosed positive. So what has been actually seen on the physical examination is that uh, this particular client uh, has got um, a positive sign on the examination of the central nervous system. Kenning is positive, is stiff neck, and uh, is also tachycardic as well as uh, having a gallop uh, rhythm. So we have also noticed that um, this client on the whole lab, when uh, exams were being conducted on the in the lab, we had uh, no result for creatinine, but urine lamb, serum crag came out positive. On the CSF, Though it came out negative, but we had high pressure when uh, the procedure was being conducted. On the ART part, the client is not yet on art. And um, the RAPR, HB, so this RAPR actually was negative. HB, the result has been given. And uh, uh, EAC is actually being uh, followed up. So now there they are, they are these, these questions from, from the team. So the questions which are being asked uh, is um, number one, in the absence of a positive uh, CSF crack, can we make a diagnosis of cryptococcal meningitis? So what approach, that is question number two, what approach should be used for treatment for TB and cryptococcal meningitis co-infection with regard to the use of steroids. Question three, what recommendations can be made to the Petaoke team in the management of this patient? So we will start first of all with um, clarifications, questions to the presentation which have been done then we'll go into um, uh, responding to the questions which the team from Petauke uh, has for us. Any clarity? Additions, question, clarification to uh, the case presented? Network, is there any question? Okay, so um, Dr. Wesi, it seems that everything is clear. So we, we will go now into, um, into uh, the set of um, uh, question answers. Okay, we have one hand up. Uh, Paul Mwale, please go ahead and mute and go ahead. Uh, good, good afternoon, team. I think my question is very simple. Uh, I would love to know the clinical outcome of, of this patient, of this patient. What was the outcome of this patient? Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Wezi, any clarification? Uh, yes, to of course. This question? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. So uh, we have been seeing uh, this client regularly from the time that she presented to us, I think on a bi-weekly basis. As of her last visit, which was actually this week, um, she has shown uh, quite marked improvement. The uh, hemiparesis that she was having on the left side of her face is resolving. She's now able to talk coherently and she's actually very well oriented now, both in time and uh, place, and of course in person. She has uh, also regained 
some of the strength that she lost in her lower limbs, although she's not yet able to walk without support. Um, in terms of her um, management, she started her ART uh, two days ago. So we, we saw her two days ago and she's now on ART as well as um, her treatment for cryptococcal meningitis and uh, TB um, treatment. I submit. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Wezi. Is I hope that is clear. So we, if there are no other hands up, so we we will go straight to our first question. So uh, we have the panel of experts with us. Um, so now question number one: In the absence of positive CSF, Craig. Can we make a diagnosis of cryptococcal meningitis? Our experts uh, on the call. Can we um, respond to this first question? Okay, let me go first. Um, I think uh, it's, this is a tough one. Um, this is a tough one. Uh, what uh, comes to mind really is a seemingly like some kind of uh, uh, diagnosis leaning on one uh, C uh, CNS condition than the other. So this patient was a serum Craig negative, serum Craig positive, but CSF Craig. Uh, 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 negative. And then uh, the patient also was urine lamp positive and there were suggestions on the x-ray and others uh, that the uh, patient obviously had uh, tuberculosis. Thank you for that. Um, so I will answer it in, in this way. The CSF crack has a sensitivity of almost 98%, 99%. Okay. Um, and then India Inc. also sensitivity is about uh, 95%. So if the two uh, samples, uh, uh, if the two tests actually were negative for uh, for CSF for uh, crypto, I would take it as such, because the specificity is equally very high. Um, and so uh, I would lean more on another condition, not crypto. Um, uh, the glucose was also low, which really in the picture of uh, bacteria such as uh, TB. Um, a cell count would have been very helpful as well, uh, but obviously we know uh, our challenges. So in this case, um, uh, I, I noticed in terms of treatment, um, I, I noticed in terms of treatment, uh, well, where are we? Where are we? Yeah, in terms of treatment, uh, yeah, so we had amphotericin B. Sorry, so I, I went off a little bit. Uh, so how, do, how was the timing? Because the, we, did we actually start everything amphotericin B flu, uh, uh, and fluconazole well and 4 F, uh, FDC? So um, the, the client was first started on uh, 4 FDCs Good. and fluconazole. Well. Okay. And, and then, then uh, yeah. And amphotericin B? And for Jason B was started, I think about three three days later, when three to four days later, when it was sourced. Uh, and the, how many days of AMFO? Uh, she had received uh, eight eight days in total. Okay, all right. So the the, the comment would have been um, that clearly the patient didn't have um, uh, C, CNS uh, crypto, but the patient definitely had uh, a cryptoposis, which was the. Reviewed in the serum uh, crack. 
So uh, two weeks of high dose uh, fluconazole um, uh, could pretty much have done well. Um, the question is the um, steroids. Um, the patient had the uh, signs, uh, CNS um, uh, signs and symptoms, and that, that cranial uh, nerve palsy. I'd have loved to hear more uh, whether that's the only lesion which was there. Uh, TB meningitis, um, more than crypto meningitis, who present with the uh, uh, cranial nerve uh, palsies. And then we want to give a steroid. So in this case, I think it was a little bit tricky. Interesting, yesterday I was discussing a case like this on the web. So my advice would, I go with high dose fluconazole. Um, if you are really, really uh, thinking it could be still uh, crypto, then you are really stuck with that. Uh, meaning you need to give some amphotericin B to the patient as well. But in this case, I think you could have done well to go with the fluconazole or tidos as pre uh, presumptive um, uh, treatment, uh, preemptive treatment, and then um, go on with your four FDCs. Um, whether you can use the steroid or not, I think also depends to what extent the, 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 the patient, the CNS disease, CNS disease is. I would probably hold off the steroid for a week and add the steroid after we we'll put the patient on the fluconazole. Really, there's no hard and fast rule uh, uh, to this. That's the way I'll take it. Um, but also, I really like to commend the, the team that uh, you really decided to, to treat both. Um, uh, both have a very high mortality and the crypto slightly higher than uh, TBM. But then TBM without steroid also, uh, they tend to have a lot of problems in terms of um, um, uh, neurological uh, sequelae if uh, actually you, 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 you don't treat with steroids. But this patient seemingly didn't have a lot of um, uh, uh, CNS uh, complications at presentation, seeming to have an isolated cranial uh, nerve palsy. I hope that's, uh, that's helpful. I'd like to hear what uh, the other experts would think around this thing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Chanda. Um, any, any other comments from the network? Uh, I would like to jump in, if I may. Yes, Dr. Numa, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Duncan. Um, and also thank you very much to the Selke team. Um, so then I think some of my comments would be that um, Starting with the first one on the issue of the negative or positive serum crag, but negative India ink. Uh, just to say that sometimes we do have a case where what we would consider a poison phenomenon. Sometimes we have a case where the serum, crag, the CSF crag is negative just because the, the level of the antibodies are very high. And um, the alternative is where you would have the antibody, the, the patient being unable to mount an antibody response. Um, and they say this because your patient had, because your patient had a CSF, I mean, had a CD4 count that was unknown, but then if you notice that the, the HB was 8.9, it would have been very nice for us to know at least the lymphocyte counts that we could estimate what the, what the, the CD4 could be. Um, and that might have given you a clue towards whether your patient was unable to mount an antibody response. If it was prozone, one of the alternatives is that from the lab, they are able to do some dilution to be able to redilute the CSF and then try and measure and try and repeat the, the, the CRAG and the India ink uh, test. So I think that's one of the comments that I would have made that we could have tried to investigate a bit further just to see whether we would be able to repeat the CSF and and get a different result. And then also you had mentioned that the patient had very high CSF pressure. Um, I think something that would have been helpful also in determining whether you thought your patient had cryptomeningitis would have been to repeat the lumbar punctures. I'm not sure if that was done because even as you are doing serial lumbar punctures, that could have helped as would be repeating, um, repeating the lumbar punctures would repeat the India ink and also the fungal culture. Um, I don't know if how many days it took for us to do the fungal culture. I, I can see it's documented that we did the culture for TB, but then I don't know if we waited for a fungal culture. And I know Dr. Duncan talked a bit about the 
steroids in patients who have both TBS. One of the dangers of giving steroids to a patient whom you're not sure has crypto is that it actually delays your fungal clearance. And so if you've committed to treating your patient as a cryptococcal meningitis patient, you do want to repeat your CSF and also repeating your cultures so that you can, it's one of the surrogates to see whether your, your, your patient is responding to treatment. Um, regarding the particular therapies, I think Dr. Chanda has talked at length for those. Uh, so I think those would be my two submissions for now. I will attempt to answer question three um, after we conclude yeah. on question one. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Mbewe. Dr. Taouke team, do we have uh, any questions so far or clarity? Uh, for now, uh, we have no questions. Uh, thank you for the feedback from the experts. Okay. Yeah, just Thank to go on, on the post zone effect, also called prozon effect. Um, a very good point, especially if you, you only have the antigen test. Um, however, uh, the culture in these circumstances should come out positive. Did they try to do uh, the culture? Because uh, if, you yes, heavy, so. yeah, if you have heavy antigen uh, presence, the culture will be positive. And so that's how we normally classify it as a positive, um, uh, a, a false uh, negative CSM. Okay. So mm. unfortunately, the, the culture for um, crypto was uh, not done, was not yeah. available. Yeah. Yeah, but I'd also expect that the, the uh, India Inc. 10 should also um, show up. Uh, if we, we had a lot of uh, um, uh, antigen. Uh, yeah, so I think that is uh, one of the issues to think about when I think about the post zone or, or prozone um, uh, effect. Um, there are a number of case studies around that topic, actually, um, except, you know, uh, most of them are from the advanced countries where culture uh, is routine. So they get a negative credit, but they're able to grow uh, the, the bug on culture. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Numa, for bringing up that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chanda, for that uh, clarity. Uh, on, on, on the way, Dr. Chanda, you've explained, it's, it's like you even tackled question number two on the usage of steroids in this situation. Maybe you may kindly alight more on the usage of steroids just to clarify more on question number two. Yeah, so uh, steroids uh, in crypto or uh, meningitis particular have been shown to um, increase mortality and also uh, delay the fungal uh, clearance. Uh, the opposite uh, um, is the case for TB meningitis. Um, so also concerning uh, TB meningitis in this patient who has TB, um, based on checks, uh, chest X-ray and lamp, um, the sensitivity for um, uh, expert is not that, that great uh, uh, compared to sensitivity of the uh, serum crack. So you find uh, studies mentioning um, sensitivity of for 60%, but usually it depends on the, the gold standard uh, where you are using, whether you're using a clinical combined or pure agriculture. Um, that's in, in the CSF. So uh, it's, it's, it's not as good as the crypto. So I would say we don't have TB meningitis in this patient. Um, we we'll say we don't have crypto in this patient. We are very, very sure. But we cannot be certain that we don't have TB meningitis because the, the, the diagnostic is suboptimal for CSF. So would would miss out one in three patients. So in this case, we're going to treat as TB meningitis, but also pre preemptive treatment for crypto, like I explained earlier, uh, uh, giving fluconazole at 1,200 milligrams OD for two weeks. Um, of course, you start your ATT immediately. You can delay your steroids unless the patient has a, a much more uh, cranial nerve passes. But I'll still delay it for a minimum of a week uh, to let at least the uh, fluconas or do its job. Um, because I think if we started earlier, okay, the, the risk of also spreading the crypto from the periphery to the CSF uh, uh, is, is plausible, uh, it's possible, and you don't want that to happen. In our crypto meningitis study, 
I think about five to eight percent of these patients had the co-infection of um, uh, crypto and the TB uh, confirmed on uh, CSF uh, uh, laboratory uh, workings. So yes, I think we we'll treat um, uh, crypto as non-CSF uh, uh, crypto and then treat uh, TB as a TBM. Yeah. Uh, and I think basically the team tried to do the same. Of course, they are a little bit aggressive with the crypto adding uh, info, but I think there's no harm uh, with that approach they took given the circumstances. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Uh, Chanda. Um, and um, uh, look, looking at uh, these, these two uh, responses, it actually uh, answers question number three, Dr. Dr. Wezi. Um, the recommendations that can be made to the Petauke team in the management of this patient. Do you have uh, any further follow-up to make to this, Dr. Wezi? Uh, yes, I have. Um, oh, yes. Oh, um, I'm sorry, before jumping in, I also had a few comments on the aspect uh, of what Dr. Chanda was talking regarding the diagnostics for TB. Um, and I know we mentioned that the gene experts was negative and then we were not able to do culture, but I had a concern about this patient, perhaps preempting um, number three, in that the patient has an HP of 8.9. I think we should really try and get maybe even a stool gene expert if the patient is not able to produce sputum, because we would be concerned if the patient has another um, non-tubicular mycobacteria, particularly MAC, which would possibly give you a miliary picture on X-ray which would possibly give you a post positive for your urine lamp, and it can also give you your age of 8.9. And um, I think one of the problems with relying too much only on the urine lamp is that we don't get to know whether our TB is drug susceptible or drug resistant. So one of the guidances that I, well, one of the recommendations that I wanted to add is if we could at least try and get a microbiological confirmation of the TB that the patient has, that it's TB, uh, MTB complex and not MAC or one of the other NTM, and then also to see if the TB was drug susceptible. So just recommending a urine lamp and then a, a, a stool gene expert in that, in that case. Um, sorry for interrupting, but I thought that was an important point to, to note. That, that, that's great, Dr. Numa. Uh, that is actually much appreciated. Uh, Dr. Wezi, um, any uh, addition to or comments, questions? Because um, uh, we've actually answered question number three. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Mwamba. Um, yeah, uh, like what Dr. Numa said, I think that's something that we, we missed. We do have access to this client so we'll definitely make a follow-up and see if uh, we can uh, collect a, a mycological mycobacteriological sample or stool. Um, my last question uh, following the discussion on the use of steroids is at this point six weeks into her treatment is it cost is it recommended that we start the steroid now or is there no use before at, at this point yeah i submit okay thank you so the question is are we um at at what time are we um supposed to consider having uh steroids so um Maybe we can also give chance to anyone from the uh, College of Physicians who is on the call to actually take up this question. Okay, so if there is no one, Dr. Dr. Yuma, you can chip in, then Dr. Chanda will conclude for this case. We pass to the next presentation. All right, thank you. Um, I believe your patient is beyond two weeks from starting the anti-TB yeah. treatment. Your patient has already started ART. I think at yes. this point, there's no point in starting the steroids. We, we, uh, we might have missed that window, but fortunately you've said that she's recovering um, and some of her neurological function is returning. 
But then before I hand over to Dr. Chanda, a few more recommendations about this case that we shouldn't forget. Um, remember your patient first presented in September, but then this is almost six months later and she's on, on, only being newly diagnosed. So maybe one other recommendation is that we do need to intensify on our case finding for HIV because it's quite unfortunate that she's had all this time, yes, presenting even to traditional healers with her headache, but we did delay in making a diagnosis of HIV. And then also the fact that she's in a polygamous marriage and we don't know the HIV status of the other partners in the marriage. So I think we, since we've got access to the patient, we, we really need to make sure we know the status of all her, all her husband's partners and also of her seven children. Um, so this, I guess my point is that this is an opportunity for us to link with other, to provide linking for her children and also for the partners for the spouse. Um, I Thank you, Dr. Yuma. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Dr. Yuma. Uh, Dr. Chanda, do we have um, uh, any comment to summarize this case? I think there's a hand there. Oh, okay. 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 And uh, Lillian, please go ahead. Lillian, go ahead. Uh, Lillian can't unmute. Uh, can we help Lillian to, to get unmuted? You can go ahead. I, I've seen, okay, thank yes, you. you can go ahead now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before Dr. Chanda concludes, uh, uh, my contribution or my question is outside the three questions of discussion. I'm just interested to know, uh, with such a high dosage of, of fluconazole once daily, I know uh, you hadn't started on amphotericin, which wasn't sourced then, but it, somewhere along the course it was sourced. And then I, I believe she also started on the ARVs. As when someone is co-infected like that, and then you, you give them such high dosages and very strong drugs, are we... Are we scared of injuring the kidneys? Thank you. Mm. All right. Um, so where do I start from? So the high dose uh, fluconas or, um, is something we have uh, tried, and um, uh, it's got a very good safety profile. Actually, our uh, ACTA trial, which we did here in Zambia, uh, Malawi, and the Cameroon, were the first ones to use uh, in a big uh, trial, a randomized trial, to use high dose fluconazole. Actually, most of our worries were around the um, uh, patients with a risk for prolongation of QT, QT uh, uh, syndrome. Um, we did ECG on the first about 200 patients and so on. And then we found, we didn't find any risk. So then we continued the trial. So in terms of um, a kidney injury, not so much a worry with the uh, fluconas or probably with the uh, amphotericin, uh, they call it again. It's not like we found very significant uh, risk. So one thing is the uh, crypto untreated and the crypto isolated the crypto antigenemia, like in this patient, if it's left untreated, uh, they are likely to develop uh, full-blown uh, crypto within six to 10 weeks uh, in the majority. And within six months, like everyone who hasn't been treated, they will develop a crypto meningitis. So you have to treat it. Uh, the previous protocols tried to treat this with low dose um, uh, fluconas are about 800 milligrams. Um, they were not so successful. And so 1,200 milligrams has become a standard worldwide and um, including uh, the latest trial uh, by Javin and, uh, and group uh, where they used the single dose uh, liposomal apotericin and um, uh, they used the uh, uh, 1200 milligrams of, of fluconazole. So yes, 
it has an acceptable safety profile given the, 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 the high risk for mortality for the disease, which as you know, if it's not even treated, uh, if it's CNS meningitis not treated with, with the AMFO, uh, the mortality is 100% at 90 days. Okay, so uh, those are the, uh, our considerations. So I think the fluconazole or 200 milligrams was okay. Um, then they started the TB uh, treatment on time. Um, so I think uh, that approach was fine. And the, as you, uh, I'm sure the, the team observed, the patient started responding well, even probably before they added the, the amateristone B, because they were, they, were, they were being very cautious, uh, clearly, uh, given the, the circumstances, and the, that is correct. Yeah. So um, there was a question on the uh, uh, steroids, which uh, Dr. Numa answered. So what I wanted to add to that is uh, um, uh, TB meningitis uh, severity is classified as stage one, stage two, and stage three according to the British Medical Research Council uh, criteria. And the steroids basically are given for, for 14 days if the patient was in stage one, meaning the patient has a TB meningitis, but without any neurological deficit, they have got a uh, coma scale of 15-15. So you, you can give steroids for, for two weeks, um, no need to extend so much. But if they're in stage two, we, meaning they have either some neurological deficits, uh, uh, cranial nerve palsies, out augmentation, Glasgow coma scale, or less than 15, uh, you have to think of giving the steroids for a month alongside your, your TBM treatment. This patient has clearly looked more like stage one. I can't remember what the, the or the, looked more like stage two. So meaning um, we needed to give those steroids in the first four weeks. That's where the effect mostly is, but we are well past that period. So I agree with uh, Dr. Newman. Um, uh, there's no need to add steroid to, to this patient. And it looks like uh, the patient is going to recover well. Our biggest worry, and the reason we put steroids in TB meningitis, is it tends to have a lot of neurological uh, uh, complications well after the patient is actually treated. More than 50% of patients with TBM will end up with uh, some neurological complications. That's why we use steroids to try and reduce the inflammation, uh, um, which would worsen uh, this neurological sequelae. So by and large, I think um, a, a good case, well thought through um, in terms of the management, well presented, and I think it was clear to all of us who are not there as to what was happening. Um, and I think I would like to commend the team uh, for all the efforts they put in. Um, and I, again, I noticed even the timing of ART, I think they did it um, uh, right when uh, very good timing, uh, given the advanced HIV in this patient. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much to the team, and please keep it up. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, very encouraging remarks, Dr. Dr. Chanda. Uh, team uh, Petauke, uh, that is actually much appreciated. We are now moving to the second case. This is a case from um, Lusaka province, uh, Kanyama. Dr. Nirongo, she's uh, the case presenter. So, um, case number two under Kanyama. Case number two. IT, can we have uh, case number two? And let's help Dr. Nirongo to unmute. She can't unmute. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Nirongo. Um, Dr. Nirongo, uh, presenting a case from on behalf of Kanyama, as Dosaka Province. May I please have the case?
Thank you. So I'm presenting a case of um, a male 35. So it wasn't it, it wasn't added. Um, the patient uh, presented to us with the following uh, complaints: generalized body weakness, a severe headache which had been there for seven days, a headache. Oh, sorry, this was written twice. Uh, it was not associated with any vomiting, no blurred vision. However, the patient while in the hospital. Uh, the mental state has started deteriorating. So upon admission, this patient presented to us with a GCS of 1515. And two days later, the, GC, the GCS started dropping to 13. And then two days later, it went uh, as low as 10. So the patient was noted to be confused, uh, speaking irrelevantly. And at some point during the night, we were called because the patient started becoming um, uh, violent to the bedsiders. So prior to the presenting complaints, the relatives gave a history of a patient being dizzy before presentation. They denied any palpitations, any fatigability or body swelling. Patient had no difficulty in breathing. They denied any weight loss, fever or night sweats. And past medical history, patient was a newly diagnosed RVD patient. Uh, the, the wife gave a history of patient being diagnosed on the 5th of January. The patient uh, presented to us on the 12th. So the patient had no history of hypertension, no asthma, no epilepsy, or any other comorbidities. Uh, drug history patient had only been given, um, had only given a history of uh, studying ART on the 5th of January. On physical examination, uh, general condition, the patient was fully conscious. CS was 1515 on admission. The no, patient was not pale, no jaundice, no cyanosis. No cyanosis. Uh, the neck was supple. The clinic sign was negative. Brzezinski sign was negative as well. On chest, the chest was uh, equal, air entry, bilaterally, no coughing. Uh, CVS, S1, S2 was normal and regular. Uh, the abdomen was soft, non tender, no, no organomegaly noted. And MSS is no skin changes, no rashes, no pedoedema. Uh, patient was managed as a case of cryptococcal meningitis based on the following lab results that I'll just read. Next page. Uh, on our clinical timeline, uh, at the moment when the patient uh, presented to us, our lab, the machine was down in the lab. We were not able to do a full blood count. Creatinine and CD4 were collected and uh, sent to the private lab, but unfortunately they did not get back with the results. As they said, the results were contaminated. Uh, urine lab was done, which was negative. Serum, uh, serum cryptococcal antigens test was sent to the lab as well, and it came out positive. CSF uh, cryptococcal antigen was not done because the relatives and the wives had not consented. Um, Genex part well, came out negative as well. Uh, imaging tests were not done. Next slide. Um, patient was on ART treatment from the 5th of January. Uh, she, he was on TLD. Uh, RPR uh, together with uh, the full blood count and these other uh, tests were not done because the family said they could not manage. So we went to the most important um, Test that we needed at the time, we sent for serum uh, cut and tat. Next slide. Um, the patient was on TOD, just enough of uh, lamivudine and diluted gravel. Patient was also on the following drugs while in the hospital. Uh, firstly, we started with Geftriaxone and Salbactam because of the the tests and the inability to do the CS, uh, the CSF, we were not, not able to collect. Uh, 
but because patients um GS, gcs started deteriorating we um started inventory we've started fluconazole which was 800 milligrams we were not able to start inventory soon right away because of the financial situation of the family patient was also on uh, septrin and uh, paracetamol so but uh, a week later the family went and they sourced for the money and they said we, we, we were able to start the patient on amphotericin B because of the patient because of the patient's um, JCS at the time, which was uh, 10, 15. Next slide. So our questions uh, that are coming from the facility as Kanyama, uh, how do we monitor our client in an environment with such constraints? Number two, how do we improve our uh, sample referral system with QTH in order to change the status quo? Number three, the patient showed marked improvement on amphotericin B and fluconazole and later discharged. What are some of the errors which could have been noticed in, in the way this patient was managed? Thank you, I submit. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dr. Nihongo. Uh, this is a very good uh, case uh, presentation. Um, maybe just uh, uh, in, 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 in summary, we are actually dealing with um, an adult male, uh, 55, with um, headache for seven days. Uh, which is not uh, associated with um, um, which is not associated with vomiting and this is a newly diagnosed uh, client uh, who came on the 5th January uh, this year so this client had a positive urine, urine I mean a negative urine line positive crag and negative uh, gene expert so the client was actually put on a TLD, which is the first line. And this client was given fluconazole, septrin, and paracetamol. And later on, when B was available, it was actually provided. So now these are the three questions for uh, our Lusaka team. How do we monitor our client in a environment with uh, such kind of constraints. So how do we monitor this client? Uh, maybe before we go to the question, any clarity to what has been presented? Question for clarity. Okay, so we have no question for uh, which seek clarity. So we can um, go straight and answer our first question. How do we monitor these clients in uh, this particular kind of constraint? The College of Physicians, do we have any doctor on the call under the Zakov to pick it up? Um, I'm not sure. I, see, I think I've seen Dr. Chitalu somewhere. Um, a, I'm not sure if the, the, as the panelists, uh, we are different from Zakov. Uh, I think we, we mix, probably someone mixed up things. Uh, I'm sure we, myself and Numa, were also presenting Zakov. I think so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the correction, Dr. Chanda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So maybe you may, you may oh. uh, help us with question number one. Okay. Um, before we get to that, uh, again, I'd like to commend the team for uh, a great presentation and um, uh, uh, focus uh, and the focus despite the challenges, obviously, you know, in our health system. Um, I'm glad Kanyama, we're trying to implement advanced HIV uh, 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 guidelines there uh, currently. And we hope we sort out some of these issues. Having said that, 
the only thing I noticed was um, uh, the protocols for treatment of uh, uh, cryptococcal. Uh, first, this patient had a, a positive serum, had negative lamb, had negative expert. Okay, good. So therefore, we say the patient has some kind of cryptocosis. Is it CNS or not? Yes, the patient um, had some uh, CNS symptoms. So we would assume likely crypto or another meningitis, but not TBM. Okay. Um, so my first question uh, to the team is, I noticed the patient was on TLD. Uh, uh, when did we start the TLD? Did the patient, since the patient was newly diagnosed, did we start on the first day? Um, actually, the patient presented to us on the 12th, not on the 5th. The 5th was when the TOD was initiated and the patient was not managed by us. I think they went to a local clinic. So when the patient presented to us, it was after initiation of the TOD. Uh, how many days? Uh, the, the patient said on the 5th and he presented to us on the 12th. So I think that was about oh. five to seven days in between. Okay, one week. So um, um, again, the, the, our emphasis, and then I noticed the patient uh, GCS deteriorated whilst the, the patient was um, uh, uh, admitted, right? Yes. Yeah, that was before you even started treatment for uh, for crypto. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So why I was asking that is the emphasis on need for us to screen for everyone. Um, um, for crypto and for TB and other opportunistic infection baseline before we inject uh, ART. Clearly, this wasn't done. And what we are seeing in this patient is likely that uh, we are having early um, uh, crypto iris because they missed the screening. If they had screened, they would have picked the, the fact that the patient was positive and they would have put on high dose the fluconazole and delay ART injection by two weeks and then you start. Uh, then coming to our activities at Kanyama, um, and uh, also I forgot to bring this up with the other uh, team. The issue about uh, crypto is we, tr we try to stick to the three phases of induction, consolidation, and maintenance. I think while we have outlined this in the advanced HIV guidelines, which I believe everyone uh, has access to now. Okay. And in the induction, we emphasize on high, high dose fluconazole and high dose remain 1,200 milligrams. I know there's always that fear uh, in the past that going over 800 milligrams was uh, deleterious to, to the patient, which is not the case. Uh, I think all the trials in the last five, five, 10 years, we have used uh, high dose fluconazole. So I would have loved to see 1,200 milligrams there. And the, uh, uh, since you're using amphotericin B, induction is supposed to be for two weeks. Yeah, uh, and then very good, you didn't stop the ART. I've seen, I've seen cases where because the ART was erroneously started, then they stopped the ART, then they treat uh, for crypto, then bring back for, for the ART. Okay, so then after consolidation, uh, um, following induction, well, depending on the regimen you're using, that's a discussion for another day, whether you're using amphotericin B and fluconazole, which is 14 days, amphotericin B plus fluoxetocin, which is for uh, for two weeks, liposomal amphotericin, uh, uh, for one week, sorry, liposomal amphotericin B uh, and fluoxetocin is single dose of liposomal amphotericin B and then seven days of fluoxetocin. Mm -hmm or 14 days of fluoxetocin rather. So either way, uh, all these uh, uh, regimens, what we try to emphasize is induction. We are trying to eliminate as much of the uh, crypto as possible. So we, we really have to pay attention to the induction phase. Uh, then after consolidation, but one of the biggest problems, um, Andrew, I'll come back to that, I've seen a chat. Uh, one of the biggest problems is maintenance. We are discharging this patient uh, off fluconazole. Please, after discharge, this patient should be going home on fluconazole 400 milligram for at least a year, 12, uh, 12 months. I'm always comfortable with that. 
I'm not sure about the CD4 thing and the BCD. We have put that and two CD4 recovers and things like that. But please put these patients on maintenance, okay, of fluconazole, uh, 400 milligrams. So some people uh, give 200 milligrams, but they have to be on fluconazole for at least 12 months from the time they started their, 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 their treatment. So uh, the, when you don't put them on maintenance, the chances of them relapsing is almost certain. So we are seeing a lot of uh, cryptococcal meningitis relapse because people are sent home uh, without uh, maintenance fluconazole. Andrew has posted something there. Um, uh, yes, flucytosine is part of the treatment guidelines, uh, the latest updated, yes. And we have it in the in the country, so it's uh, it's about your 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 local uh, pharmacist to order. Um, there is a, a regimen where you can use uh, flu, flucytosin at 100 milligrams per kg body weight, plus fluconazole at 1,200 uh, uh, milligrams for two weeks as a, an oral regimen induction. I hope that helps. But we have put it in the advanced HIV guidelines. So how do we monitor in our environment and the, how do we improve the, so we are, we, I think we are talking about, I will, I, I will answer the monitoring, then I'll read Numa to talk about the referral. So I think clinically we have to learn to monitor these patients even when we don't have um, uh, the laboratory. For instance, monitoring for, for crypto implies that you have to check um, renal function. We have to check electrolytes, particularly um, uh, uh, potassium, because hypokalemia can be a, a bigger problem, and the patient will remain in bed, weak, uh, sometimes have got arrhythmias, and the, all those things we have to, to be checking, um, because we are all government institutions. Half the time, if you guys run out of reagents there, uh, we are, we, we probably just takes three, three days, we also run out of reagents here. So it's a, quite a tricky one. Um, and especially if you are going to miss, uh, for instance, uh, a renal failure. Um, uh, uh, we really just have to work with family to try by all means to at least in a week uh, do the urea and the retrice and create nine for these patients. Um, yeah, I think that's the way I would, I would put it. It's, it's not that, uh, that straightforward. I will invite maybe my colleague, Dr. Numa, to step in. Dr. Numa, thank you, Dr. Chanda. Dr. Numa, any comments? Okay. Oh, Dr. Numa can't unmute. IT, please kindly help us on this one. Okay, Dr. Chitalu, kindly go ahead. Oh, uh, Dr. Mwamba, I've managed to unmute now. Maybe before Dr. Chitalu comes in, I can go ahead. Yes, please. All right, um, I'll start from the bottom. I know Dr. Duncan was talking about the referral system, particularly with the agent. And definitely this patient needs to be monitored closely. Um, I guess my question to Kanyama would be, are they making use of the, the courier system that has been set up in the HIV program, particularly for couriering um, viral results? I know it, our UTH system can't accommodate every single patient, but for such a patient who is critically ill, I think this is a patient whose samples should be prioritized because it's very dangerous indeed to start treatment with amphotericin B and TDT, TDF and not know your renal function. But then even if you can't get a creatinine, at least the baseline should have been a urinalysis, which is supposed to be a big stage test. Um, but I think, yeah, my main comment would be for such a patient, I would prioritize the samples to be added to the courier system that takes the viral um, samples. And as we do know that the SACA has been subdivided into the sub-districts and all, this, all, the, all the first level all the general hospitals now know where to send their samples to. Um, what I also wanted to comment about was on the fact that the CSF wasn't done because the family was concerned about consenting. Maybe my question would be to ask how often you engage the family because often people are afraid. And if you just sit down and have a good conversation with them, usually it helps 
I'll lay some of those fears and just reminding people that the lumbar puncture is the same as doing uh, like the the spinal tap that we do for anyone who has a severe infection. So usually that's what I ask my patients first is if they've known any woman who's had it here then and if that woman died because of the lumbar puncture. Because if your patient indeed is being treated for cryptococcal meningitis, you remember how important your serial lumbar puncture is to relieve the CSF pressure. Um, so I think that for me was one of my big concerns that we're not, like we just, we gave up. And I'm not even trying to say force the patient to do something they're not comfortable with. Uh, what I did notice with some of my interns and some of the junior staff as I've worked with is sometimes as clinicians, it's like we are afraid to do the lumbar puncture and we're almost excited when the family says no and happily write in the file that lumbar puncture not done due to consent. But I just wanted to impress upon the presenter and also the, 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 the general audience of how important the lumbar puncture is for a crypto patient, both for monitoring and for therapeutics and how if we understood the importance of the, the CSF, then we would be able to, to allay the patient's fears. Uh, and from my interactions with people in other countries, it's only Zambia where we have this abnormal fear of lumbar puncture. So it's really upon us as clinicians, as nurses, as just to really impress upon them for crypto patients how we need to do the lumbar puncture. And then my last comment was going to be on, again, linkage and knowing your child's status. We know that your patient is 29 and he's married, but do we know the HIV status of his wife and any of his other sexual partners? And if the wife proved to be positive, if we know the HIV status of the children, and again, for this patient with CNS symptoms, um, Syphilis, I know, again, was a challenge in terms of logistics, but that, again, is a sample of 150% because your patient's presentation could have easily been due to neurosyphilis. Uh, thank you, Chair. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Anuma, for this uh, summary. And um, at the look of things, you've summarized all the three questions. Uh, Dr. Chirufia, you had your hands up. Please, can we go ahead? Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to, I think a lot of things have been said. I just want to say something a little bit. Uh, if you can, uh, the one with the, if you can go to the previous slide uh, where there was that treatment. Yes, um, I, I, I raised my hand up for quite a while, but I was failing to unmute. And probably the first question I had before uh, I give my contribution is, um, with the safe drugs on Sabactam, what were we treating? Yes. Dr. Nirongo, may you kindly clarify uh, on yes. this, this one? Yeah. So, um, on, on the safe drugs and on Sabactam, I can't comment because it was started by my senior. So maybe he can clarify more on that if he's on the call. Okay. Dr. Moma, are you logged in? Good, 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 uh, good afternoon. Yes, Dr. Moma, can we go ahead? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moma, here. So when uh, this patient, as uh, the history has been uh, given, came in, we uh, initially thought of um, you know meningitis, but we had uh, no um, particular. Uh, we didn't have any tests at the point at the moment, so we we um, we uh, empirically started him on uh, this um, broad spectrum antibiotic to basically just cover because we thought the duration was a bit short. So it could have been um, probably some. Um, hello? Yes, Dr. Muma, please go ahead. Okay, so I was muted. I don't know if you, you got the, anyway, I was trying to say that uh, that was uh, basically an empirical treatment because initially when the patient came in, we did not have any uh, particular 
uh, lab tests available, but was suspecting meningitis. So we thought it could be as well be a bacterial meningitis of some sort. And so we put him on um, uh, the, the high dose uh, keftraxone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, Dr. Ch Chilofia, you may kindly go ahead based on yes, that response. Yes, yes, thank you so much. Um, so when you are uh, um, meningitis, uh, we're looking at crypto, usually it's a chronic. And for acute, I think you have a bacterial etiology. If you are going to treat an acute bacterial meningitis, your dosing for ceftriaxone is 75 milligrams per kg body weight per day. And that's usually comes around to two grams twice daily. However, if you're going to treat for meningitis, your salbactam will reduce your, your penetration of the ceftriaxone into the CSF. So probably in future reference, if you need to treat a meningitis and you have ceftriaxone salbactam, the salbactam will not get into, will inhibit the entrance of your ceftriaxone salbactam into the CSF, and that will not treat your bacterial meningitis. So we thank God that it was another etiology for the meningitis. That's one of the corrections I just wanted to highlight for us. And then most of the other points have been highlighted. I just wanted to say that um, our patients also died because of small things other than just a lumbar puncture. Uh, it's how we monitor the UNDs. It's uh, how we monitor uh, other things like uh, potassium. And if you're not able to monitor potassium, sometimes you can use proxies to help you, okay? So for example, you need to monitor urine output. So you should measure how much the patient is passing out per day. That's very key because that will tip your patient into kidney injury. And then also they might be polyuric and that will help you with balancing of the fluids. Then um, the other thing I wanted to say is uh, the electrolyte, besides the electrolyte imbalance, Please, if you suspect them, examine your patient again. Go through the same steps of examining the patients um, where you listen for the bowel sounds. And sometimes if you are able to do an ECG, you can be able to do an ECG. Um, last but not the least, probably unrelated to this patient is that if you're also going to monitor, especially amphotericin B, you might need to look for the HP of the patient. Some patients can have a drop in anemia that can occur um, uh, as a result of the drug. So those are my few contributions. I think the rest Dr. Chanda and Dr. Mbeo have highlighted very well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Chitalu. This is actually very uh, insightful. Uh, unfortunately, our time, we've, we've, we've already overshot by 15 minutes. Um, I can see um, uh, there is a comment from uh, Dr. Chitembo that we need to rebrand the name Lamba Puncture. <laughs> yeah, maybe. So Dr. Uh, Dr. Chanda, may you kindly chip in and um, give the concluding remarks, I think as a summary of uh, this case number two. All right, uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, um, thank you very much, fellow uh, panelists. Thank you very much, uh, the presenters and uh, um, uh, colleagues uh, for attending this. Uh, uh, medicine is about learning um, on a daily basis. Um, uh, I always appreciate every day that I learn something new. And I'm sure some people have learned something new. We have also learned something new about either the management of the patient, um, the situations our colleagues are in when managing these patients. Uh, the, both cases have been a great uh, 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 learning points, um, they, as you heard from all the contributors. And um, uh, I think uh, let's all read the advanced uh, HIV uh, guidelines, uh, which we are, we are rolling out. Um, uh, this will help us in really uh, 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 screening our patients correctly, putting them on the correct uh, protocols and the, on the uh, correct uh, treatments. Uh, glad to see that efforts have been made um, uh, from the two presentations. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who have got similar uh, patients. It's not uh, uh, worse or more complicated, uh, but the trick is in sharing these uh, challenges 
Um, I think we still have uh, the uh, toll free uh, line for HIV ID. Uh, that should be 7070. There's always a consultant to answer some questions. And um, uh, for most of us, uh, you can always just pick up uh, a call and uh, uh, just uh, uh, pick up the phone and just give me a call or any other the, um, um, people who are experienced in managing their patients. Um, I think uh, this has been a, a, a great um, afternoon, morning afternoon for me. And um, I would like to thank everyone for taking their time. Uh, see you uh, uh, next time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chanda. Thank you, Dr. Nyuma. Um, thank you, Dr. Chitalu. Uh, Dr. Nirongo and uh, Dr. Wezi, that was great, uh, really very interesting. Uh, we shall meet you next time. The meeting is over. Bye bye. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, now.